Okay, as we pick up our series of sermons, we've been talking about influenced. Uh, Today we're going into a direction of we're influenced by God. That's what we did last week, but we're influenced by God for God. God wants to change you. God wants to somehow make a difference in your life so you will help make a difference in somebody else's life. And I wonder, uh, uh, are you willing to say that you're making a good difference or a bad difference? Which would you say? Well, let me just say this. Why is it, and think for me just for a moment, why is it we somehow pass on some of the traits we don't want to. Now, you know what I'm talking about, parents. You know, like uh, impatient. Anybody, anybody in here impatient? Is your child impatient? Yeah, typically so. They are, you know, they can't wait. You know, they're, they're so excited. It's like Christmas every day. They're so excited. They can't wait. Can I open a present? Can I open a present? Two o'clock in the morning. Can I open them now? Two thirty in the morning. Can I open them now? You know, the excitement that goes on in the lives of, of individuals. We somehow pass on these traits that we really kind of wish we didn't, right? We look at our lives and we say, man, where did they learn that? Well, look in the mirror, Okay. Sometimes you're going to find out that your child is mimicking you. They're becoming like you. Where this influence begins to make a difference and and how God wants us. Why is it that we don't pass on the traits we need to? We want to pass on good traits. Amen? Amen? We want our children to catch the good things that we do, not the bad things that we do. And we have that tendency so often not to be uh, focused upon the good traits and the bad traits are being passed on. And Paul talks about this. He says, man, there's a problem. There's a war going on. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But there is no way... And uh, as the illustration, there, there is no way that we go through this life and not have some form of influence upon others. Is that true? I don't care who it is. You have some form of influence upon individuals around you. There is no way to escape that. And I personally, I want to be influenced by good. And more importantly, I want to be influenced by Christ. Okay, I want to I, I want to look at the good. I don't want to look at the bad that people do. I want to look at the good that people do. I want to be influenced by the good. And more important, I want to be influenced by Jesus Christ. And when we're influenced by Christ, things begin to change. Things begin to happen in our lives. So I ask this question as we really begin to, to look at scriptures and begin to uh, answer some of the questions here today, is how much has God, Christ, influenced you? How much has God or Christ influenced you? And you see the passages of scriptures that we're going to refer to. We're going to touch on them in just a moment. So it gives you an opportunity not only to jot them down, but also to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to these passages of scripture. Where we look at Galatians chapter 6 and Philippians chapter 2, we begin to see this. So the question is, how much has God, Christ, influenced me? Let's make it personal. Is there a big difference? Some people say, well, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, there was not much of a change. There wasn't a big difference. I'm here to tell you something. I don't care who you are. When you receive Jesus Christ, there is a night and day difference. Even the best, the most moral individual, when they are influenced by Christ, when Christ changes them, there is something about them that is remarkable and and it is seen by other individuals. So, you know, how much has God, Christ, influenced you? Now, let's look at a couple passages of Scripture. Let's begin back in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10. And this is what we began to see and how we began to relate uh, as we look at these. And we need to realize that God changes us to be used by Him to help change others. That's the purpose. That's what God is doing. God is doing this in your life. If you're a believer, God is changing you in order to be used by Him to help change others. Other people need Jesus. We need to know that. 
We need to be excited that God has changed us in hopes that somebody else will be changed, influenced by you, by me, and to make a difference. So here, Galatians chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. Be not deceived, okay? Who's the deceiver? The devil, okay? The devil's the great deceiver. Uh, some of your friends are deceivers, right? Yes, okay, you don't have to answer that. I know it's the truth. But be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So when we begin to look at scriptures, we begin to see that God is, is, is writing to, uh, revealing this message um, to the church there at Galatia and, and dealing with some of the issues that was going on. That he is helping them to get in the path of realizing how you act, well, how you have been influenced is something that has, has uh, consequences. The things in your life brings consequences to us. Now, let me give you some truths that we need to consider, we need to, to, to look at this morning. These are some truths, and we can talk and we can uh, relate this here, and I will in just a second. Uh, basically, fundamental truths that we need to consider in the area of influence. Number one, or not number one, but just a point. God never influences you to do evil. Is that right? God never influence. Listen, if you do evil, it's not God telling you to do it. Get over yourself. God never influences you to do evil. I mean, look at what he's beginning to say here. He's saying that, you know, what you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap of the flesh. So, I mean, this is the concept of what's going on. So God never influenced you to do evil. He wants us to be just. He wants us to be righteous. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to be a role model to other individuals. And I'm here to tell you, if the church was more of the role model that God would have us to be, the churches today, in spite of this, would still be full. Amen? Amen. So something's happened. We need to realize God never influenced individuals, people, churches to do evil. God doesn't influence us in that way. You could, that's contrary to his nature. God is love. You go over into 1 John. God is love. That concept we realize, we know. That is his nature, is to love. So he does not influence us to do evil, nor, uh, and truths to consider, God doesn't want you to die in your sin. Now that's a good thing. It, people somehow say, well, if there is a God. Well, people, let me tell you something. There is a God. And we need to acknowledge that. And we need to realize that God doesn't want you to die in your sin. We know this truth because of the love that God, God does love. Now, look at the passage that we just read. Uh, Galatians chapter uh, 6 here. It says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. For he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the same reap life everlasting. So there is a, a difference here. While God doesn't want you, God has provided a way. God has done everything in his power to bring peace into the hearts of individuals who are struggling. Who have such... Uh, adversity in their lives. They bring it into their lives and it just stays there. And God is wanting to deliver people from that. And by that, we begin to see that he not only wants to deliver them, he wants to somehow change their lives forever. You see, God doesn't want you to live with hatred. Now, do you know where hatred comes from? It comes from yourself. You know that? Did you know that? You hate others because there's something in your life, listen to me, there's something in your life that is not right. Christian, listen, if you have bitterness and hatred towards any individual, okay, there is something not wrong with them as much as there is wrong with you. 
Because if the love of God abides in us, we are not to be like the world. We are to be like Jesus Christ. That's right. We're to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to live with that, uh, you know, that, that sense. I mean, hey, you, you know how long, it ta- how, how much time it takes, that, that hatred in you, it just kind of eats at you all the time. I see people around that, uh, they avoid me. Not because I need a bath or something, please understand that. But they avoid me. They see me coming and they like, you know, they look and then they just like, oh gosh, there he is again. Not because I'm bad, not because I'm evil, but because of something in them. They're uneasy with something about themselves. And that's sad. If we're going through life, these are some truths that we need to consider. So not only is that a, 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 the, the fact that we need to consider, how about this one? A truth that you need to consider is this. God never said, Christ never said that Christian road is easy. This is a truth, people. It is not easy to be a Christian in this world we live. Even in America, even though we're supposed to have the freedom, do you realize they're trying to take our freedom to worship away from us? It's happened. There are states that said no worship. But people, listen to me. There is no state, no governor, no person that can stop Christians from worshiping. Can't be done. You say, well, yeah, they can. They're doing it. We're letting them because we're not getting together somehow in worshiping Christ. Let's gather around the churches. Let's open the the parking lots again if we need to. And let's get back to the fundamental responsibility of worshiping. Well, we might be locked up. I love what John MacArthur, he he had said, if you've been following him out there in California. uh, John MacArthur said, you know, he says, they're they're having church. In in, uh, in spite of what the government's saying, in spite of all the harassment they've got from the government, in spite of all the battles that they're having, Uh, He said basically this, if I get locked up, I've always wanted to do a prison ministry. I thought that was great. You know, the Christian road is not easy. You think it's easy? Look at Paul. Paul says, hey, listen, you think you've got it bad. Let me tell you about the story of my life. Paul begins to just lay it out there. How many times he was shipwrecked? How many times he was out in the deep? How many times he had been beaten to the point of death? And we somehow get in this mind that that Christianity is some easy road. Well, once you receive receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's no issues, no problems. Man, you declared war on the ruler of this world, Satan. And he is mad. That's okay. That's okay. Because that's a truth that we need to understand. There is a war between the flesh and the spirit, and we are not to give up. Look what he says here in, in Galatians. Uh, He he says, let us not be weary in well-doing. You know when you get weary? When you don't see results, when things are going worse, when things get tougher. That's when you start getting weary. When you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. In other words, when you start out on a journey, it's dark. But yet you, you, you're praying and you're hoping, well, it's going to get lighter. It's going to get, and it keeps getting darker. You see, that's what he's saying here. He says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due times we shall reap if we faint not. You know what he's saying? Finish it. Finish it. Don't be a statistic of individual who claim to be Christ-like, who abandoned Christ in the midst of some trial. Well, let's move on. In Philippians chapter 2, if you'll take your Bibles and turn over there, Philippians chapter 2, we begin to see how God's influence changes us. This is what God's influence and how it changes us. God changes us. God changes you. If you have no sign of change in your life, then the people, let me say, you have not met the God that I have met because he changed my life. 
He has caused things to happen in my life that I never dreamed possible. So here is Philippians chapter 2. Uh, and, and I want to just pick up at verse 2 through verse 5 because I, I broke this up in this segment. Uh, uh, verse 2 through 5 is his desire. Now listen to what his desire is. He says, uh, fulfill ye my joy. That's his desire. That is the desire that what Paul is writing to the church there at Philippi. He's saying, this is what I want to happen. He says, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded. This is what we need to begin to see. God's influence, God, his desire is for you to be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, the unity is right there. And the unity is respect for one another. Without respect for one another, there is never any unity. So we have to come into the, the, uh, the, the relationship realizing every person is valuable. Even though they differ, even though there is a conflict that arises, there's ever. So he says in verse, verse 3, let nothing be done. This is, this is his desire now, verses 2 through 5. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You know what it's saying? It says, quit focusing upon you. Quit whining like a baby because you don't get your way. Start looking at others differently. Uh, let's go on. Uh, and look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind, here you go, this is the desire. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is what his desire is. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. Do you have the mind of Christ? Well, look at his example. That's verses 6 through 8. Verse 6 through 8 is his example. You see, Jesus never asked you to do something he wasn't already doing. You ever have somebody ask you to do something that they weren't doing? You know what that makes that person? It makes them a hypocrite, right? But Jesus never asked you to do something that he was not already doing. Here's what he begins to say. Verse 6. Who be in... In the form of God, now think about that, here he is in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. You know what that means? That here he is, Jesus Christ knows what it is to put other people above himself. Isn't that what he did when he left heaven? He looked down from heaven and he saw the hopelessness of mankind. And he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to lower myself from the position of godness and become like they, like man. And he was born. Made himself no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, this is, this is even going lower, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, which was considered to be the lowest, uh, the, the awfulest type of death anybody would ever experience. That is the humility. Humility of Christ, where he humbles himself. So here's, here's God's influence upon us. As we look at it, his desire, verses 2 through 5, his example, verse 6 through 8. What God's influence and how it changes us is he creates a new you. That's, that's number one. He creates a new you. I'm not what I once was. I am now what Christ is helping me to become. Christ has freed me. So now that I'm freed, I listen, I can soar with the eagles. I can become what God would have me to become. And so when you look at this concept, he creates a new you. And in the creation of a new you, he also creates in us, his influence changes us to where we now have a love towards God. I'm convinced if more church members had a true love for God, things would be better. 
Well, God may be important on Sunday, but the rest of the week is mine. There should be a desire to learn more about Christ. There should be that hunger in our souls for us as individuals to be more like Christ. To learn more, to be like Christ. And when that begins to happen, when we have that inner desire to love, have that love towards God, it allows us to have a love, love towards all people. I love all people. Now, let me say this. I may not like what they do. Got it? But I love them. You know why I love them? Because Christ loved them. Christ loved me in that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. That's love. And so he exhibited, he showed forth the love, and therefore I am going to learn, and that's a learned process because the flesh says, hey, I, I, you know, they don't deserve my love. But Christ says, neither did you. If you go over to Colossians chapter 3, you begin to read and you begin to see how we are to love others as Christ loved us. Wow. So we need to have a love towards all people. So he creates that. And, and next we need to have a refusal. How God influences is changing us. It is a refusal to Satan and sin. When was the last time you told the devil no? You need to start telling the devil no. And the power of God. You have the ability not to give in to the devil. You don't have to sin. You don't have to do the wrong that most people will do. You have the power living in you that has changed you, that gives you the ability to say, enough, no more. I will not obey the devil. We can refuse Satan. We can refuse sin. And what that causes us to do is to realize that God's influence changes us, that wherefore we will have a desire for others to know Christ. You know why we don't care if people don't know Christ? Because somehow we have missed what really knowing Christ is all about. Christ is about good things. And good things are meant to be passed on. We are not to keep it to ourselves, but we are to share it. We are to have a desire for others to know Jesus Christ. I'm saved, people. I want you to know that. Not because of my goodness, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, I'm saved, and I want other people to be saved because I know the outcome. I have read in the Bible that those who do not know Christ will suffer the consequences. Well, let's, let's touch on uh, just very quickly some ways that God influences us as individuals. And uh, these are somehow repeated from what we have talked about in the past, but just ways that God influences us. God influences us by His Spirit, okay, by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit moves you, you ought to move. When the Holy Spirit wants you to speak, you ought to speak. When the Holy Spirit wants you to shout, you ought to shout. shout. You're catching on. When the Spirit of God moves you, why are we so silent? Let's speak up. What are they going to do? Kick us out of this world? Hey, listen, I got a greater world waiting. Kick me out. Kick me as far as you want out of this world. I got a greater world that you cannot kick me out of. So his spirit, by his word, that is another influence upon us. His word, his word, his word. I stress reading the Bible. You want to know, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. When was the last time you really read, read the Bible and sought the Bible when you're struggling with the issues and trying to find out what God is wanting to say to you? You've gone, you're not going to find it out there in the world. You're going to find it in his word. There's been times when I've struggled and I turn into the word of God. And I said, there it is right there. God's speaking to me. And so we are influenced by his word. We are not only influenced by the spirit and his word. We are influenced by his church. Amen. The church is important. We know that. I mean, you, you look through scripture and you begin to see that very important truth that we can begin to understand. But not only that. We are influenced by his world. <laughs> Here you go. 
There are critics who look at this world and say how awful this world is. But I'm here to tell you something. This world is beautiful. Now man may have made it awful. But this world that God created. It reveals to us. You see when, when we look. How this world influences me. Is it reveals to me. A loving. Caring. Creator God. He created things structurally. And I'm going to say this, forget global warming. Because the moment that God wants to, this world ends. You say, but we can, let me tell you something. If we turn back to God, scripture promises that God will heal our land. This world, I look at it. And I see how like produces like and how he's got structure and order. And that is an influence. How about the next one? Ways that God influences us is by heaven. I mean, you talk about an influence. There is, there is something better than now. Now, don't get me wrong. I enjoy life. Yes, we have problems, but I enjoy those good times. I mean, it, isn't it true that if it wasn't for the bad times, you wouldn't know what a good time was? Is that right? Yeah. So by having those bad times, we can then turn around and, and here's the thing. People think, well, you know, I've got to have 10 years of goodness in order to celebrate. No, you don't. All you need to have is one minute of goodness and that's what you ought to be celebrating. You might have 23 hours and so many minutes of, of badness in the day. And you have that one 50, 20, 30 minutes of goodness. You, you ought to celebrate it. If you, if you are painless for, for a, a less than five. I mean, if, if the pain is not there for five minutes, rejoice. Even rejoice in the pain because we're still alive. Well, why we need God's influence. Let's get into this. We need God's influence because without Him, without God's influence, without God, you're condemned. Sorry to tell you. No, I'm not. I want to tell you. That if you don't have Jesus Christ, if God hasn't influenced you, then your life without him, you're condemned. You're doomed. You're lost. You're on the road to destruction. There's no hope for you. You say, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm making it pretty well. And go back to Galatians where he, where he begins and he talks about. And he says there, uh, fundamentally, for he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap. And he says, shall reap. Flesh reap corruption. You know what that means? You can gain this whole world and lose your soul. And what do you have? Nothing. That's pretty much what Jesus said. And so when we look at that, without him, we're condemned. Not only without him, we are condemned. Without him, we need to know. Without him, you cannot be forgiven. Yes, I can. I can. I can go back and I can apologize and I can make things right and I, it, it's going to be fine. I'm going to be forgiven. No, we're not talking about that. You may mend some bridges that have been burnt and in the mending of those bridges, that doesn't mean and doesn't bring to you in the area of forgiveness. This is why we need God's influence to be forgiven. Our greatest trespass is is not against man as much as it is against God. Think about that. Your, your number one trespass is against God. And by trespassing against God, you'll trespass against everybody else. So without Him, there's no forgiveness. What Jesus Christ did... There's no hope. 
because we're still in the condemnation of our sins. Well, let me give you number three. Why we need God's influence. And I want to give you kind of a theological word. How about that? One that I'll say is theological. Not that it is really theological. But I think it really just sums up this. Why we need God's influence in our life, in your life. Because without him, here you go, here's the theological word. Without him, life stinks. Ain't that, I mean, that's theological. No, it's not. But that is the truth. Without Jesus Christ, without God's influence, life stinks. Because we see all that is going on, and without him in our lives, life is somehow, there is depression, right? People get depressed without him. They stay in the depression. They stay in despair. They stay in this, this woe is me attitude, this mentality of, it, you know, it's only going to get worse. And, you know, why is this happening to me? Why, why? All this, this whining and crying over the issues that you cannot control. And what God is trying to do is to change that in your life. And so we need God's influence because without him, Life, and I'm going to say it like this, life isn't worth living. So Christ comes in, Christ changes us, and the, the bottom line with that, we need to realize that God cannot do anything for you until you first turn to Him, until you seek Him, as your Lord and Savior. You see, God may be wanting to do something in your life, but you're not letting Him do that. You're ignoring the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You're ignoring what God is telling you about your condition of your life and where the road is going to end up. And you're choosing the flesh and what you sow, you reap. You sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh. Satan has an influence upon many individuals. And Satan's influence is already turning us further away from God. Did you know that? Satan never turns you in the direction that God wants you to go. You wonder where you got where you are? It's because Satan's been turning you and you've been listening to the devil in all of his lies. So he's turning us further away from God. And when we really come down to the nitty gritty, today is the day. Today is the day. This moment is the time for us to turn to Jesus. And I ask it like this. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to be like Jesus? I mean, do you want to be influenced by God? And if you're influenced by God, then you're influenced by God for God. You're influenced to the area of, of being used of God. Do you want to be used by God? That would be another question that we could ask. But in, in this concept of what we need to realize and we need to answer for ourselves is this. I'm following Jesus. Who are you following? In this world, I'm following Jesus, but who are you following? Are you following Christ? Are you following flesh? It's your choice. Choose wisely. Because you only have one life. And when that's gone, the rewards of heaven are the rewards of the flesh. Hell awaits us. Let's pray. Father, bless us. In these moments, we have heard from Scripture. We have stressed some of the important points of our lives and how influence is needed there and what God is trying to do. I pray today that God is speaking to the hearts of individuals who somehow have drifted away, to the hearts of individuals who need to make a decision
to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, you love us. You proved us. And you want to come into our lives and help us to be such an impact, such an influence upon this world we live in. Change our hearts. Change our lives. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.